All right, let's try this again. Um, let's try this again. Uh, <laughs> good evening, everyone. Uh, and again, just like to thank uh, uh, Sister Johnson for the introduction. And indeed, the uh, the Johnsons and I have gone back for many, many years. I consider them both uh, dear friends of, of my family. I definitely appreciate their ministry and blessed by it. And whenever they call, when I'm available, I always uh, been over backwards to uh, to try to be at any event that they are uh, in charge of. Uh, give me one quick second because I actually have some students that are that are texting me right now asking me for the for the Zoom invite so they could go on. I did give it to them, but they asked me for they asked me for, uh, for it again. So give me one quick second that I could send it to them. Um, uh, so, uh, there you go. Uh, all right. And I'm sure that many, uh, uh are keeping an, one eye on the news, what's going on tonight in America. Uh, and, and because of that, I mean, maybe <laughs> some people prefer to talk about Revelation 13 and Daniel 11 and Revelation 17 and all that. And maybe in a, in a future study, we can present uh, those studies, which are very, very uh, important uh, in light of uh, the Bible prophecy that we live in today. And definitely everything is in place. But at the same time, whether you voted or not voted, that's between you and God. And, um, you know, uh, we do know that God is in control. He's the one that sets up kings, removes kings. So... Uh, whoever we voted for tonight, whoever wins, we are at peace because we know that God is in control. And I say, you know what? We know the last days are going to come, and it's going to be very, very difficult and terrible for God's people. Those are going to be faithful. But I say, you know what? Let it come. Because the sooner it comes, the sooner we go home. And uh, for that, I, I'm grateful. Uh, let me try this evening as we begin to share my screen. Um, let me know if you guys can see my screen. Can you guys see it? Yes, no, no, yes. The the the, the yes. slideshow here. Okay, so you should be able to see yes, this. It. Okay, you should be able to see this. All right, wonderful, wonderful. So I know we prayed, but this is such a very important topic this evening, and our time is very limited. And uh I don't know what uh what uh I don't know how far we're gonna get this evening. Uh, so let's pray again and ask the Lord to bless us um, as we begin. Father in heaven, Lord, as we begin, I pray that you'll be with my students who are trying to get on. They're having difficulty. They're texting me right now. I pray, Father, that uh, they can come on and be blessed. And Lord, especially in this subject, that even though it is so very basic, at the same time, it is so very important. It is crucially important. Because if we are wrong on this basic fundamental belief, Lord, everything else will be wrong. So please lead us and guide us into all truth. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. So, um, uh, uh, please lift me up on Facebook. Up my to sorry on Facebook. They're having problems. Um, uh, but anyway, so when it comes to justification, justification is the most basic and fundamental principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the bottom line of salvation. Basically, if we do not experience justification, we have no hope whatsoever for salvation. None. Uh, in fact, if we go to Romans chapter 5, verse 18, as we begin in Romans 5, verse 18, the Bible says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So until you and I experience justification, we are under condemnation. 
because condemnation is the opposite of justification. And justification is the opposite of condemnation. So again, until we experience justification, we are lost under condemnation. And just like with all other truths, Satan has provided a counterfeit to this justification truth. Just like there were false gospels being taught and presented in the day of Paul, and you can read about that in the book of Galatians and 1 Corinthians and even the book of Acts. So today, we have false gospels that promise to give something that they will never deliver. In fact, if you go with me to Revelation 14, in Revelation 14, we find the three angels' messages. And, and, and many forget that the three angels' messages is the gospel. Because in verse 6, we read what says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now, the result of this gospel is found in verse 12, where it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So the true gospel will produce a people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. A false gospel, no matter how good it sounds, no matter how good it may make us feel, it will never produce the kind of people that God is looking for. And justification is the very, very basic principle of that gospel. So, what does the Bible teach about justification? How are we justified? Well, we're going to find out right now that there's actually two different aspects of justification. And by the way, the word justification simply means that, you know, to be justified, to be, to be declared innocent, not guilty, to, to be free. I mean, I, mean I, I trust we all know that. I mean, if I'm accused of a crime and I'm taken to court and, and, and you have the whole trial and, and after, you know, several days of me being tried, evidence is presented and, and, and the judge asks the jury, has jury come up with a verdict and the verdict says we find the defendant Gomez not guilty. That moment that I'm pronounced not guilty, I am justified. I walk out of the courtroom 100% innocent, not guilty, free to go. That's what that word means. But there's actually two aspects of justification that we're going to take a look at. The first aspect, we could read about it in Romans chapter 4. So let's go there. Romans chapter 4. Romans 4, and let's go to verse 6. The Bible says, Romans 4, verse 6, the Bible says, Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So the first aspect of justification is one that is declared, God forgives us, period. Our sins are forgiven. I'm no longer a guilty sinner. In, in other words, when I fall on my knees and I sincerely ask the Lord to forgive me and I trust in the merits of the shed blood of Jesus on my behalf, that moment, God declares me just. I'm forgiven. I'm pardoned. Simple as that. 
Now look at our first statement here this evening. It says, as the penitent sinner, contrite before God, discerns, oops, sorry, uh, discerns the, uh, as, as, as a penitent sinner, contrite before God, discerns Christ's atonement in his behalf and accepts this atonement as his only hope in this life and the future life, his sins are pardoned. This is justification by faith. Pardon and justification are one and the same thing. Through faith, the believer passes from the position of a rebel, a child of sin and Satan, to a position of a loyal subject of Christ Jesus, not because of an inherent goodness, but because Christ receives him as his child by adoption. So again, justification is forgiveness of sin. Justification is being adopted into the family of God. There is no merit on my part. I do not earn it. I definitely don't deserve it. God simply forgives me. Because I ask and I believe. That's the first part. The first aspect of justification. Our next statement. The grace of Christ is freely to justify the sinner without merit or claim on his part. Justification is a full, complete pardon of sin. The moment a sinner accepts Christ by faith, that moment he is pardoned. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to him, and he is no more to doubt God's forgiving grace. Now, there is a fancy, nice theological term that Paul uses. The word is impute. Now, what does that word mean, impute? Well, the key word is put. Right there, put, imputed, it put. We, we are given credit for something. It is given to our account. It is now ours by imputation. It is put to our account. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't work for it. It is simply credited to us. It is put to our account as if it is ours. So when we accept Christ, his righteousness is credited to us as if we have lived it. And thereby, we're forgiven. We're free. So I want to make, make that clear. It's put to our account. Now, the second aspect of justification, and this now, we begin to separate the true gospel from the false gospel. Because let's be plain here. I mean, again, this is a big, huge topic. If we believe that the gospel, as understood by the Seventh day Adventist Church, is the same gospel as understood by the evangelical and Protestant world, you cannot be more wrong. Our understanding of the gospel is totally different than the understanding of the gospel by the entire Sunday-keeping world. Because many believe, oh, it would be the same gospel. We just, you know, we go to church on, on Sabbath instead of Sunday and the state of the dead. And no, 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 no. We have a total different understanding. Because, see, the evangelical gospel, the gospel that is believed by the majority of the Sunday-keeping world, stops here. They stop here. But there's more to justification. Okay, there's more than just this. So, let's go on here. Okay. Um, 
let's go on here. So uh, anyway, I miss I messed up here on the on the screen. I did some I probably shouldn't have done, but anyway, um, let's go on here. I I I don't know how to get. Uh, let me try this. Uh, there you go. So the second thing to understand about justification by faith is found in the book of Titus. So let's go to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And let's go to verse 5. Titus 3 verse 5. The Bible says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, that is a passage we should read over and over and over again. But for the sake of time, we won't do this. So, but look carefully at how God saves us. Okay, question: Does the washing of regeneration refer only or primarily to to the waters of baptism, or is this washing of a renewed heart? Did not the thief on the cross experience this washing? even though he could not be baptized? Absolutely. What we find here is a heart experience. It is a complete transformation. It happens in the mind. It changes my values, my attitudes. The Holy Spirit renews my mind no longer Am I self-centered? No longer is it all about me, myself, and I. Now I am Christ-centered. Now I have the mind of Christ. When this washing and renewing has been accomplished by Christ and the Holy Spirit, then I am justified and have eternal life. So is there more to justification than simply being forgiven past sins? Absolutely. Because this right here is justification experienced in the inward life. Notice that justification follows regeneration and renewing. Jesus put it very, very simple. In John 3, 3, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So in its most basic expression, justification experienced is the new birth. So the new birth does not follow justification. It is justification. We cannot be justified without being born again. They're one and the same thing. Look at our next statement here. And now why can't I? There you go. It says, thoughts are not a blessing. God's forgiveness, watch this, is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. David had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed, create in me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me. So God's forgiveness is declared, yes, but it is more than that. God's forgiveness is not only a declaration, but it is a reclaiming, a transforming, a renewing. 
It is a clean heart created within us. And this is not sanctification. It's part of forgiveness. Justification transforms at the same time it declares. Pardon, forgiveness is an inward transformation. It says, in ourselves, we are sinners. But in Christ, we are righteous. Having made us righteous through the imputed righteousness of Christ, God pronounces us just and, and treats us as just. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now in case you didn't realize it, this right here goes totally against the common view of justification that we find in the evangelical world and that sadly has also entered into the Adventist church. Because here it says that before God pronounces us just, he makes us righteous. So justification by faith is not only being declared righteous, but it is also being made righteous. Today's popular theology says that justification is only being declared righteous. And the making righteous comes later in sanctification, if it comes at all. And notice also that we are made righteous by the imputed righteousness of Christ. Imputed clearly means more than a legal declaration. So again, justification is making us, making us righteous inwardly as well as declaring us righteous legally. And, and there's a difference. Again, the false gospel simply says, no, we're declared righteous. And it stops there. We're seeing here, uh-uh. Justification is not only a declaration, but it is also making us righteous inwardly. Our next statement here. As the sinner, drawn by the power of Christ, approaches the uplifted cross, and prostrates himself before it. There is a new creation. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Jesus Christ. God himself is the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. So again, justification is receiving a new heart from God. It is becoming a new creature. And, and for quite some time, there has been an attempt to separate the transforming power of the Holy Spirit from justification to put it totally, totally within the process of sanctification. And we'll talk about sanctification later. But what we're finding in these statements is that transformation and making righteous is part of the justification process, after which God declares us righteous. So again, justification is simply another name for the new birth, the new creation, the new heart. Short statement here. By receiving his imputed righteousness through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, we become like him. Notice, it is the imputed righteousness that comes through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Now, some say, that we're justified by Christ 
and then later sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Nowhere does the Bible or the Spirit of Prophecy say that. Nowhere. Nowhere do, do we separate the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Both are involved in justification and both are involved in sanctification. But it's clear. It is clear that imputed means more than simply declaring. More than simply being given credit for. There's a transformation, a renewing that takes place in justification. Review and Herald. To be pardoned in the way that Christ pardons is not only to be forgiven. Look at this. <laughs> to be pardoned in the way that Christ pardons is not only to be forgiven, but to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. The Lord says, a new heart will I give unto you. The image of Christ is to be stamped upon the very mind, heart, and soul. So to be pardoned means to renew. It's quite simple. So again, the first part of justification is to be forgiven. The second part is to be transformed in the new birth experience. Justification is both declarative and experiential. But again, today, most Christians just focus on the first part. The second part, the new birth, they want to apply to sanctification. But if you think about it, that then means that you and I can be justified and saved before the new birth happens. And even if the new birth experience is not changing my life as it should, I am still justified and saved. That is totally unbiblical. Separating the, the declaring righteous and the making of righteous. And my friends, I believe that this false view of justification is doing more harm than almost anything else to us as members of the body of Christ. Because what this teaches is that you and I can be in a state of justification without being born again and still allowing sin in our lives. And that is a totally, completely false gospel. Now, look at the time here. Wow. There is a term that I've heard years ago, and I still hear today, and, and, and quite frankly, uh, uh, not too long ago, I actually was speaking at a church and, and someone interrupted me from the front as I was speaking because they didn't like what I was saying. And that is this. Many people believe that God's grace, that God's justification is unconditional. Unconditional. We hear people say that, you know, I am unconditionally covered by the grace of God. I am unconditionally covered by his justification. The grace of God is unconditional acceptance. To talk about conditions in salvation and conditions in justification is legalism. Well... Let me say one thing that I've said a million times. Let's not confuse being loved by God with being accepted by God. Being loved by God and being accepted by God are two completely different things. Yeah, we can't say God's love is unconditional. But being accepted by God is very much conditional. 
And that C word, conditional, is kind of like a cuss word in, 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 when we talk about these things. They don't like that word. But being accepted by God is very much conditional. And we are nowhere talking about legalism. Nowhere. I, I mean, in fact, let's show you one verse here. Uh, go, go with me to Second, um, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. This is a you know well-known passage, but notice the condition. Second Chronicles, chapter seven, and let's go to verse. Let's go to verse thirteen. Bit of the context. Second Chronicles seven, verse thirteen. God says, "If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locust to devour the land." Or if I send pestilence among my people. Now look at the next two letter word. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. Does that sound conditional? God says, if. And then he says, then. That sounds conditional. God's blessings are conditional. Because if his people don't call on his name and don't seek his face and don't turn from the wicked ways, is God going to hear? Is God going to forgive? Is God going to heal? No. So quite frankly, my friends, there's no such thing as unconditional justification. There's no such thing as unconditional grace. It sounds nice, but it's not true. Notice the next statements here. It says, let none say that there are no conditions to salvation. There are decided conditions. At the peril of our souls must know the prescribed conditions given by him who has given his own life to save us from ruin. Here's another bad word. Obedience is the first price of eternal life. His righteousness is imputed only to the obedient. The righteousness of God in justifying the believer in Jesus, condition of his future obedience to the statutes of God's government in heaven and earth. Look at this. From Genesis to Revelation, the conditions upon which eternal life is promised are made plain. Keep my commandments and live is the requirement of God. The gospel, look at this now. The gospel that is to be preached to all nations, kindred, tongues, and people presents the truth in clear lines showing that obedience is the condition of gaining eternal life. Christ died to evidence to the sinner that there was no hope for him while he continued in sin. Obedience to all God's requirements is his only hope for pardon through the blood of Christ. By perfect obedience to the requirements of the law, man is justified only through faith in Christ. Is such obedience possible? God's promises are all made upon conditions. While we earnestly endeavor to be obedient, God will hear our petitions, but he will not bless us in disobedience. Now, now, these statements are quite clear, and yet they're so very unpopular. But they're so clear, I don't even have to comment on them. Obedience is clearly a condition of salvation. And this is a gospel that is to go to the whole world. 
So let us not dare speak of unconditional grace, unconditional justification, unconditional acceptance with God. That is not the case. That is, there's no such thing. Now let's take a look here at an amazing story that we find here, an amazing vision that illustrates justification and this aspect here of obedience. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah 3. Zechariah chapter 3. And let's go to verse 1. Zechariah 3 verse 1. It says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. So, Joshua is the priest, and he's there pleading before God, and Satan, as the accuser of the brethren, is there telling the Lord, Lord, no, you, you cannot accept Joshua. No, you can't. Verse 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So the Lord shuts up Satan and says, listen, yeah, he, he, he's drowning in sin. They're drowning, drowning in sin, but I rescued them out of that fire before they were totally consumed by that sin. Verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Now we know that the garments, the filthy garments, represent the sin his sinful character, his sins. He's just totally covered in sin. But he comes to the Lord. And look what happens in verse 4. And he answered and spoke unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto me said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with a change of raiment. Now notice, and this is so very important, the Lord doesn't cover his filthy garment. He doesn't cover it. What does he do? He removes it. He takes it away. And a brand new raiment is given him. That's the new life. Born again. Renewal in the mind. A heart transplant. Verse 5. And I said, let them set a fair miter upon his head. So they set a fair miter upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. So watch this. Joshua, covered in his sins, comes to the Lord. Satan says, no, you can't do that. The Lord shuts Satan up. And the Lord says, listen, take away his filthy garments. His sins are removed. Put a new raiment on him. And a mighty there says, holiness to the Lord. Now he's covered in new raiment. Now he's not naked before God. He's covered in a new raiment in Christ's righteousness. He's now before God white as snow. As, he has, as, as, as if he has never sinned. But now look what happens. Verse 6. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. What's the next two-letter word? If. Condition. If you will walk in my ways. And if you will keep my charge. Then you shall also judge my house. Shall also keep my courts. And I will give you places to walk among these that stand by. So notice. 
once Joshua had this transformation experience where he wasn't just declared righteous, he's made righteous. His filthy garments are removed. He now has a new garment. He has a new heart, a new mind. Now God says, if you are faithful, you'll walk among angels. So please get this, my friends. Please get this. Obedience has nothing to do with earning justification. Zero. But obedience has everything to do with retaining our justification. Obedience doesn't merit. Obedience doesn't earn. But obedience retains our justification. And these days, it is, it, is, it is sad because it is being taught that even if we sin, we don't lose our justification. And I'm like, really? Where does it say that? So, so if I sin, I don't lose my justification? No. Okay. Oh, well, nice. Thank you. Uh, so I could go sin city Las Vegas this weekend and, and do what I want because, hey, it doesn't lose my justification. Oh, I can't do that. So, so then how many sins can I commit before I lose my justification? Two, three, four? How many? So again, my friends, we got to be careful. Sin separates us from God. We forget that sin is offensive to God. And this must be clear because we're nowhere near talking legalism here. Legalism is where my obedience, it, it, it gives me brownie points. It, it earns something. I, I deserve something. No, 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 no. Well, we're going to finish that with, with just a minute right now, but our time is just about up. Uh, mercy, I got about it. <laughs> mercy. You know, we're not even halfway through here. But obedience does not earn. It has no merit in us earning justification. That is given to us by faith. In the blood of Christ. But obedience retains our justification. Other than that, then we're going to believe that we're justified while we live in disobedience. And that is simply blasphemous. That is not true. That is Christ dying on the cross to allow me to continue sinning the same sins that put him on the cross. Now, Today, we have a, a, a problem because it is this false view of justification at, that, that's causing all the worldliness to come to the church because now we're separating you know, the way we live from our walk with Christ. I'm justified. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what I – no. And today, because we're so afraid of legalism in the church, we try to kind of water this down. And, and I like to read a statement that Sister White wrote to A.T. Jones. A.T. Jones, as you recall, him and E.J. Wagner were instruments used by the Lord to give what is called the 1888 message, which is the message of righteousness or justification by faith. And these men were used by God in a powerful way. Sadly, they did left, leave the church <laughs> for the end of their lives. But their message was from the Lord. But A.T. Jones was taking things a bit too far. And look at what Sister White wrote to A.T. Jones. I quote, I was attending a meeting, and a large congregation were, pres were present. In my dream, you are presenting the subject of faith and the imputed righteousness of Christ by faith. You repeated several times that works amounted to nothing, that there were no conditions. The matter was presented in that light that I knew minds would be confused and would not receive the correct impression in reference to faith and works. And I decided to write to you. 
you state this matter too strongly. There are conditions to our receiving justification and sanctification and the righteousness of Christ. I know your meaning, but you leave a wrong impression upon many minds. While good works will not save even one soul, yet it is impossible for even one soul to be saved without good works. Then when you say there are no conditions and some expressions are made quite broad, you burden the minds and some cannot see consistency in your expressions. They cannot see how they harmonize these expressions with the plain statements of the word of God. Please guard these points. These strong assertions in regard to works never make our position any stronger, for there are many who will consider you an extremist and will lose the rich lessons upon the very subjects they need to know. So A.T. Jones was gaining, he, he, he was going too much to the other side. Ellen had to correct him. Now, now, we desperately need to know about the free gift of Christ's righteousness. But if we present the gospel gift without addressing the conditions upon which that gospel can be received, we have a false gospel. A distorted gospel. A gospel that will give false assurance of salvation. So, we must have a, a balance here. A balance. And so look at the next statement here now. Because we got to wrap this up. Got to, got, got, got to wrap this up. This might be the last statement. It says, But while God can be just, and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins. Read that again. But while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. Now look at this. God requires in the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. So before justification takes place, the entire surrender of the heart must be given. That's a serious thing. This goes totally contrary to what we're hearing today. We must decide to surrender. The whole heart must be yielded. Nothing helps back. We must decide not to continue in disobedience. Then to remain in a justified state comes the condition of obedience. Again, obedience is not by my efforts alone. It comes through faith in God's power to purify my soul. The decision to obey is my decision. The power to obey is given through the power of God. So these two conditions to receiving and keeping justification are, number one, surrender, and two, obedience. Without these conditions being met, there is no justification, no matter how much we claim it. And we are in serious danger of false assurance when we believe that we are justified and can continue in sin and not lose our justification. Serious danger. And again, my friends, we're not talking legalism. We're light years away from legalism. I do believe my time is up. 
we have a whole lot more to cover, but I believe that my time is up and, uh, or if, what, what, what time does my time end? <laughs> well, uh, and well, is, my, is my time up? You want to continue or you can, um, we can bring you back on another night to continue. Let's go ahead. And, let's go ahead and end here, and because I don't want to begin another point and run out of time, so uh, we could continue. Uh, I, I I believe December three it is when we're going to talk about sanctification. Correct. So, okay, awesome. We'll do that. Does anyone have any questions for Pastor Gomez? Any questions? Okay. This is more of a comment versus a question, but uh, I must say that it's a breath of fresh air to hear this. It is. Amen. Really, Amen. I appreciate it, Pastor Gomez. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. What you're what you're saying is the works must follow. The action must follow the blessing. It's Absolutely. Got to, it's got to complement. Absolutely. And you find you find that, I mean, you find that in many places in the Bible, which is Zechariah 3, go to Matthew 25, James 2. Uh, I, I mean, there, there it's it, the the again, the 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 works, the life, it shows the quality of the faith we have in God. That that's what it does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, you are saying that uh, there's three things that have to be united. It's got to be spiritual, physical, and mental. They must make one to be with one. Absolutely. And, and there, there we're getting we're getting into a a slightly different topic. But you're absolutely right because. Uh, because we not only sin at the level of our actions, but we sin also at the level of our thoughts. Yes, yes. And and, and 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 so and so we're told in in first and second Corinthians that our thoughts must be brought captive to the obedience of Christ. Right. Uh, so so if we and, and the whole point there is if we don't sin in our thoughts, we will not sin in our actions. And, and that's where we're to keep our heart with all diligence, as we find in Proverbs. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Uh, and, and and I often say this, you know, um, like, like I mean, if, if it were possible for me, I mean, how many people are on tonight? Uh, we, uh, we see, I thought I saw thirty-two people on tonight. I think something like that. Okay, well, we got like thirty. But if it were possible for me to take a cable and connect it to your head. And show what you have been thinking this past week on a screen. All your thoughts of the past week on a screen. How many of us here would be rather embarrassed and ashamed of, of our thoughts? All of us. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why Christ says in, in, in Romans, in, in, in Matthew 5, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, the Pharisees had a certain amount of righteousness, but it, it stopped at the level of actions. Well, I never had sex with someone who's not my wife. I can be the law of God. But Christ said, no, 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 no. <laughs> if you commit adultery in your mind, if you lust in your mind, you've broken the law. That's so, the so, war. So, so, so you're right. It's, 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 it's those three things together, kept by the, yes. by the power of Christ that will enable us to walk in, the, in this narrow way. Absolutely. Well, I thank you. That's what you gave me tonight. A Amen. Amen. It's on the Lord. All right. Any other questions? Comments? Hello. Yes. Good evening. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, Pastor uh, Gomez, for the uh, presentation. Um uh as as you mentioned uh, about the works that they um, are a result of our faith um uh, I think that it would be uh, good to highlight that 
that itself, that as a justification is retained through our connection with Christ, which gives out the uh, fruits of obedience and works. So that um, that connection with Christ, that connection of through faith, uh, that relationship with, with Jesus Christ that we have, that keeps us to be justified continually, and that gives the 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 result of works uh, just in case if anyone may say, well, uh, I need to work to, re to retain my justification. It's rather that, that you keep your relationship with Jesus Christ and as, as a result, you have obedience that uh, that come in uh, naturally. And, um, and also, um, uh, there are verses uh, as as well, and which uh, may be uh, good to point out uh, that uh, point to obedience. Uh, for example, the the person that came, I think uh, the young ruler came and asked what uh, how to do to be saved, and Christ pointed out to to the law. Um, so that uh, uh, verses that uh, can be used to explain the importance of of obedience. Um, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah. One thing, one thing again that I want to uh, emphasize more is mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, obedience is important, but the obedience, like in going back to Zechariah chapter three, when the Lord says, "If you will walk, then uh, if you keep on reading further, the power to do that is found in Zechariah four verse six. Then He answered and spoke to me, saying. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might nor a power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Without the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, obedience is not possible. So so, so we, we, we obey, trusting, relying on uh, divine strength to do so. Okay. And, and, and again, there's just so much here. But, you know, I mean, walking day by day, moment by moment, in a constant state of surrender. Surrender our will. Trusting in divine strength to overcome, that is where power us it is. And by ourselves, it's not that it's difficult. It's impossible. It's impossible. But with Christ, all things are possible. Okay, all things are possible. Yeah. So, so yeah, so thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you. And uh, Pastor Gomez, uh, for, uh, for the verse of uh, Titus 3, uh, why does Paul mention renewal and regeneration of the Holy Spirit? Um, what what is the difference of renewal and regeneration? Um, it, it, why use they're, two they're, words? They're, it's 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 very similar. They're very similar. Basically synonymous. Okay, the, you know the the regeneration. Many many apply that to the baptism and renewal is the renewal of the mind. Okay, so in Romans twelve one, let's be transformed by the renewal of our mind. The mind regenerates, mind being born again. When you're born again, you regenerate. Born again, it's renewal. Uh, it's, it's, it's saying the same thing in, 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 in many ways, saying the same thing. Uh, I got to run. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm being called right now. So I uh, thank you all. But uh, uh, And uh, I'm rather disappointed also because my students were not able to come on for whatever reason. So the meeting was recorded. Yeah, okay, wonderful. I'll refer him to, I'll refer him to that. Refer him to that. That's so I understand, yeah. Yeah. So, Sister Johnson, I'll let you take it from here. Yes. Thank you so much, Pastor Gomez. We'll see you on the 3rd. All right. God bless. God bless. Blessings. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, say a quick word of prayer to close out. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this time that we've had and learning more about your saving power and so we ask that you would be with each one of us help us to continue to grow closer to you and grow more in you and be able to share with others be with Pastor Gomez and his family in a very special way and bring us back at the appointed time we thank you and praise you in Jesus name amen all right amen amen, amen. God bless we'll see you next time amen Bye. amen good night yeah, good night. Good night. Good night.